So I'm a polar and uh, frozen landscape artist, and exclusively I work in watercolors. The first thing that everybody asks me is, why would you want to go there? Um, and the first place I got to go was Antarctica. I had, since I was about 15, I had read every adventure book around. This is a painting, a small painting I did of the Endurance, Trapped in Ice. I'm a big Shackleton fan. Um, and I always just, just have been fascinated by cold places. I was raised in New York City, so there isn't really a lot of kind of connection, except for having read these books. There were no girls on any of these adventure trips, certainly no Jews from Brooklyn on any of these ships. And yet, I always knew this was where I was going to go, and I was going to do it. 21 years ago, I got to go as a tourist, as a tourist, to Antarctica. Um, it was a two-week trip. People generally ask, how'd you get there? I took a plane from Boston to New York, New York to Argentina, and then Argentina all the way down to the tip of Argentina, so Buenos Aires, then Ushuaia, and then the boat ride, where that arrow is, from the tip of Argentina to the Antarctic Peninsula. That took two days, that ride, through some of the roughest waters in the world, which was very exciting. The ice ceiling is something that is referred to when you talk about women on Antarctica. I had a girl ask me once, uh, in, a, in a class, were you the first woman in Antarctica? I was like, no. But actually, um, women in Antarctica were really only there since the 50s. Um, and it's still a, a small percentage. What I wanted to see was the blue, the ice. This was the most exciting thing for me. And um, does anyone know how it, that blue happens? Scientists here. Um, it's the density of the ice. All other um, light waves are trapped, and the only light wave that can come out is the, the small blue, the really deep blue. Uh, it's really exciting to see when you see that. I started painting about two years later, although I knew I always wanted to paint it. I don't know why, but it was in my head. And so these are some of the first paintings. They're fairly realistic. And I'll show you in the next one. This is the original photo on the left, and on the right is the painting. Uh, you can see the camera mark there because I was using film 21 years ago. I didn't take that many pictures because it was film and it was expensive. Those black dots there are seals. In general, I try not to put animals in my paintings because then you kind of have, you know exactly where you are. I like the sense of this is sort of a mystery. You can see there's some pink on top of the ice there. That's snow algae that grows on ice. And so you start to see some of the colors, which were amazing there. This is the first photo you saw, and that's the original photo it came for. You can see the ship next to the iceberg. We were trying to get some um, sort of shelter from the wind. And it's actually quite dangerous to be next to an iceberg like that because eventually the water below is warmer than the air. And so the ice begins to melt below. Eventually, you know this is the tip of the iceberg. Eventually the tip part is heavier than the bottom part and it flips. And you don't really know when that's gonna happen. So it's very dangerous, you're not supposed to climb on them or do anything nearby. But most of the boats that go there have underwater radar at this point. Um, I decided to start painting. Why would I think that I could even do this? I have no experience as a painter. I started painting essentially 17 years ago. So that's four years after I was in Antarctica. I had some friends, we were called the bad girls, who um, just really were super supportive. They had bought me watercolors to take with me. And my kid, who would do anything that I told him to do. <laughs> and so here, we're, I'm making him do some uh, canvassing. So people were optimistic and thinking that I could do this. So that was OK. And I was a parent at home. So it was a good way for me to use some of that time. In Antarctica, the first thing I would say that surprised me was how much color there was. And this is the color of kelp. These are um, paintings that I made from kelp that was on the shore. And there were also bones from abandoned whaling stations, 
we think these were most likely blue whale bones because uh, that is the that's the gold standard of of whaling because you get so much bang for your harpoon buck um, and there were just bones littered all over the shore it's now the international whaling um, agreement was from 1965 so these bones are at least were at least 50 years old when I was there or 40 years old when I was there but they're now older and so they are they will not be eaten there are no land mammals in Antarctica and there are no bugs so what will eventually get rid of those is wind um, I started being able to travel with my family I had um, more subjects and more confidence the one on the left is Iceland and the one on the right is Alaska the Mendenhall Glacier for those of you who've been to Alaska as a painter I started to really think about my own style and so I began to do more and more abstract pieces and this is one of the things about not having animals in my photos in my paintings because again you put a penguin in a painting you know where it is even if the rest of it is fairly abstract but these are all based on real photos of what the real world that we live in looks like the one on the left is from an aerial photo of tundra melting in Alaska and this is um, pack ice in uh, Antarctica so you can see it's getting more and more abstract five and a half years ago six years ago I decided I would apply for an artist residency a lot of my artist friends were really supportive and said oh you should try one of those and I did apply for one and didn't get it but I got a letter with it that said you should apply for others the reason you didn't get it is because of your financial range didn't fit what this residency was so I started looking and there was this residency at the top of the world and I thought oh you know that looks interesting and I did not tell anyone that I applied for it because I was like I'm not gonna get it um, and then I get an email saying we're sorry to tell you so I was like okay didn't get it but I thought well I should read it in case they give me some advice and they said, we're sorry to tell you, you didn't get this year, but you're going next year. So I was like, okay, guess I gotta tell my husband. <laughs> you know, I really hadn't told anyone. So I was like, oh my God. So this is with the Arctic Circle, and this is, we were sailing on a tall ship around the island of Svalbard. Anybody here read the Golden Compass? That's the island of polar bears, where uh, Yorick Bernison lives. We didn't see any armored polar bears. Um, but this is 500 miles from the North Pole. Just to give you a sense of how far north, it is almost too far north to see um, the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are more available closer to the Arctic Circle. Um, to go on a trip like this, where we, I was gone for a month, it was two weeks on the boat, but I was essentially gone for a month, as a mom with, at that time, a 12-year-old kid, uh, you have to really I had to really spend a lot of time figuring out what am I going to do how am I going to do it and so the first thing I had to do was a Kickstarter I had to raise money so if you think six years ago Kickstarter was still not as all over the place and I had to explain Kickstarter is like a WGBH fundraiser only you'd be sending me somewhere um, so there were still people who didn't really know about it and I was very successful in my Kickstarter which was great um, shopping I had to do some shopping for this trip most people ask what you wanted to what I need to buy as a New Englander I didn't really need to buy that much um, the weather was pretty much the same as winter here but the organization of an absence is the big part and this is as an artist this isn't really something that you would think oh you know you have to do all these things I had to you know get the dog sitter for a month I had to you know make sure that my kid was gonna have dinner every night you know because my husband was home but he was working he had rehearsals you know he has a life too so this is it's interesting because when I speak to groups I often have mothers come up to me and say how did you do that because it is it, in the in retrospect it was insane that I did that um, and it left a mark on my family this is my son and my nephew and me we're in Brookline ice I don't know if any of you've driven past that place Brookline ice is where all the ice sculptures for um, New Year's Eve are, are are stored and so they let us do the video for the Kickstarter in Brookline ice 
So that was pretty cool. Um, the residency itself had 27 artists, six men, 21 women. They, it was uh, sex, uh, gender neutral when they do the applications. They don't know the names of the people. So this was the one with the most amount of women. Um, they were from 10 countries. And you can see on the map kind of all where they were from. There were all different types of artists, painters, spoken word, poetry. You can read all that. You can see. This is a picture of us. Uh, that the ship, the, the day we started on the ship, it hadn't snowed yet in Svalbard. And then it snowed pretty consistently after that. So we were in, sep this was in September. So right before winter sets in. And then you see the sign that says, um, beware throughout S Svalbard, danger throughout Svalbard. Svalbard has more polar bears than people in the winter. In the summer, there's a lot of tourists that go by. Um, this is what the onboard experience looked like. You have kind of a higher level um, part of the galley and then lower level. And most people had laptops of some sort. And those artists actually were able to do a lot of work, the people who use their laptops. So those would be photographers, videographers, the sound artists. Those of us who were painters, dancers, writers, we couldn't really do a lot of our work there. So it was more of a gathering expedition as opposed to a, there was just not enough space. My pieces, as you can see, are large. So they, it would take, you know, take up the whole table. It would not be possible. And of course the boat's moving the whole time. You know, there's no, there's no sort of flat time. Um, the, the places we slept were below, so there's our staircase. That, we were in bunks, that's a bunk there. We called it the nest. Then, of course, the bar, which was very important. And that's part of the galley. Considering we had never met each other before, did pretty well together. Mm -hmm. We were working when we were on the ship. This is uh, someone who was do had a GoPro that she put on, on top of a kite because, of course, there weren't um, drones then. So this was like pre-drone, first, second year of GoPros. So this was we were really avant-garde. Um, and so she was sailing the kite above and doing these really cool imaging. And she was doing a lot of map projects. Everybody had their own kind of work that they were focused on. And everybody had to give a presentation during the um, the the the, tra the evenings. So each evening there'd be like three artists, and this is my roommate giving a presentation, talking about her dog. But she was a fantastic. She is a fantastic artist. Her work is quilts made out of wood that are taken from um, Hurricane Sandy. And so she breaks them up and makes them into quilt. So really interesting stuff. She collected garbage that was on the shore, which unfortunately there was quite a lot. Um, because where we were in Svalbard was on the route of, uh, the, we were from Russia. We'd get Russian garbage was where their, the stream of water came from. And nets too. Every time we got off the boat, somebody would take a trip in that zodiac, that's the pack ice right in front of you, that means the ice that's breaking there, uh, would take a trip on the zodiac and they would go and they would look and do a tour of the area that we were going to be. And the reason they needed to do this was to see if it was polar bear free. Um, the dog was a new addition to the tour. They had never had a dog before. I can't tell you how thrilled I was that this dog was on the tour because I knew the dog could smell a bear before we could see it. I have never felt more urban than when we were talking about polar bears. You can't walk anywhere in Svalbard without a guide with a gun. Get onto shore, these are the rifles. They gather us all together. So maybe four or five trips on this Zodiac from the boat once everything was clear. Get onto the shore, we'd get our sort of water gear off and get our work gear on. And they'd say, OK, everybody stand around. We're loading the guns. The bullets are this big. And they said, you don't get two shots with a polar bear. No polar bears were hurt. That's always a big fear. But they, were, they are absolutely terrifying. Because you know, one shot, you have to get that shot right with a polar bear. So the dog, I stuck to the dog like glue. I was like, Nemo is my hero.
So then when we were there, we were in this triangulated space, generally on the shore, where on each point of the triangle would be someone with a gun. Sometimes we would take hikes. There would be a guide at the front with a gun and a guide at the back with a gun. And I would never go on the hike unless the dog was going, because the dog didn't go on every hike. People would always say, you're so brave to have gone to Antarctica. That was no fear. This was fear, but made it through it. Um, so here's my feelings about polar bears. So this is a polar bear from the distance. You can see he's kind of far off. We were on the boat. Whenever we saw the polar bears, we were on the boat. That just was how it worked for us. I was thrilled about that. Um, this is a polar bear. We had just gotten back on the boat. The polar bear was sniffing around where we had just been. And I was like, Ugh. Everybody's like, polar bear! Oh, God. But I did want to do some stuff with my art as opposed to just fear. This is Arctic ice. Uh, to some extent, every place you go with this kind of ice is going to have different ice. In the Arctic, uh, the jade ice is because um, moss and green things have been frozen. And then 10,000 years later, that's what's left. So jade ice is. And then you can see those sort of brown or red stripes. That's uh, iron in the soil. That's called glass ice. Glass ice occurs when an iceberg has flipped. So this is a very recent flipped iceberg because you get that, you know, when you, you have an ice cube in your water, the part that's underwater is clear. The part that's on top is somewhat oxidized and has that kind of white burnished bit. And that's what happens when an iceberg flips is you get the clear part up and you can see it's starting to turn white at the top. Um, those stripes are due to layers of soot that came on top of dirt or whatever, blew onto the glacier, frozen in, and then 10,000 years later, that's how you get a stripe. And that's the beginning of that. On the left is moss freezing inside of ice just right in front of my face. Obviously, that's not um, you know, ready to be an iceberg, but that's the beginning of the process. The next two pictures are, are interesting because they're both taken with color film. This is within a day or two. The left, you can see at the very edge, you can see the blue a little bit. But it's a color, it's a color picture of the crazy formations in the rock and the glaci glacier areas in Svalbard. Svalbard is a newer Earth formation compared to Antarctica. And so Antarctica has much, much, much more in terms of heavy glaciers because they're so big. They've been there for a long time. Um, in a way, it's more like Iceland up near Svalbard, which is Iceland being a volcanic island. This is just a sunset. You know, you look for one minute, it's there, and the next minute, it's gone. We were, as we were in September, we were heading towards October. The beginning of November, maybe 10th of November, there's no more light. So the days are getting much, much, much shorter. You have a sunrise, five hours later sunset, you never have high noon. It just is like up, down. And it's always this really weak light. You know, it's never really super sunny. And when you do see the sun, you're just like, oh, there it is. There was life in the Arctic, unlike in Antarctica. You did see penguins and you see birds, but the Arctic has a lot of mammals, as we know from polar bears, and there's whales and those things. These are reindeer. Um, we were actually on a hike there with Nemo, and the reindeer didn't come anywhere near us. We had some Canadians on the trip, and the Canadians said, if you hold your hands up like this, the reindeer have terrible eyesight, and they will come to see if you are reindeer. And I was like, this is so stupid. So there's maybe eight or 10 of us going, yeah. I'm telling you, they came right up to us. <laughs> it was like, whoa, here comes a reindeer. And they were totally fine. They weren't interested in us, really. And, and then this is the big city on Long Year Be uh, called Long Year Bean on Svalbard. And you can see it's not a big city. There is a university there, though. And there are people who live there all year round. There are schools for kids because they're professors and people who live there all year round. The children in the schools all have to, they have a play area. At the play area, 
They go out in their very, very bright vests. Remember that part of the time they're going out, it's totally dark. They have lights on their vests. And uh, there's always someone with a gun. They count them coming in. They count them going, you know, coming out. They count them going in. Because you just don't want to lose a child to a polar bear. That's a painting of some of that same earth formation. To the left, this is an abandoned whaling station in the Arctic. They don't have any buildings really left in the Arctic. And that's because, for the most part, they're still whaling in the Arctic. And they whale on factory ships. So anything that would have been there, they would have moved off into something that they could use. But this is moss that's growing in the area that was a whaling station. And the moss, we weren't allowed to get close to it. You could not touch it. It was about 50 years old, this moss. And it grows on the oil of the spilt from the whales. So it's this crazy, grows tiny, tiny amounts. So there must just be tons of it in the soil because it grows just based on that. There's the painting of the moss and the ice, another one of the formation, and then some of the glaciers. Uh, so then the question is, what did I learn from it? Um, what am I doing now? This is obviously a picture of me. One of the things about being an artist is there's next, you could get a degree, but it doesn't really mean you're an artist. You kind of just have to say you're an artist to be an artist. And that's it. And then people believe you. Um, and so one of the things on the trip, I was feeling very self-conscious. I felt like, well, I haven't been doing it this long. And there are people here whose workers in museums, who teach college, who, have been, who are retired artists. I mean, there were some famous artists on the trip. And I thought, you know, I should just kind of keep my mouth shut. And they were really encouraging. And one of the things they talked about is, is permission. Permission to say, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do something different. And it doesn't matter, because I'm an artist, and I can try and do that. Um, and it's just sort of owning that word, uh, which is the own your artist self. Practice, this is something that pretty much everybody knows, that you do a little bit all the time, and it adds up. Um, you have to just keep at it. And a lot of artists go and they just work and maybe they're not doing something that's focused on what their show might be or what they're teaching or whatever, but it's just always sort of fueling that artist head and you just have to keep working. Um, small steps add up. You just a little bit all the time, walking into your studio, do a little bit, walk out, walk back in. It just does add up. And I found that communicating through a blog and then doing writing was actually really helpful because a lot of putting your art out there is about sort of being able to say, this is what this package is, and this is why you might be interested in it. Um, a lot of times I'd say that artists don't feel comfortable writing about their work or talking about their work. And I don't know, obviously don't have any problem about it. But that is a really important part of being able to share your work with the world. There's nobody who's, you know, or the person who is being discovered by Instagram with no other explanation is rare. You know, you're going to have to sort of talk about yourself a little bit or your work. So now it's five and a half years later, and I am still processing what I learned there. I'm still a full time mom, I still have my kid at home for another four or five months but and that is something to try and balance that there's no question that that's tough I have not been able to travel as much as I wanted it was actually a very difficult thing for my son that for me to be gone a month he had started a new school and that was the first four weeks of his new school and we really paid for that you know I had to come back and be not just full-time mom I had to be 110 percent mom and then, you know, maybe I could do some art on the side. And you just have to find which weeks you can do which. Then, uh, we didn't get to travel as much. I've been to Iceland since uh, I got back, but that's the only place I've been to since. And so I started taking photographs of winters in Boston, some of the ice formations here, and doing some more abstract pieces. And I'll, I'll show you a few of them. 
I have new surfaces. You can see over there that square piece is on something called clayboard. It's actually not made for watercolor. Everything I work on is water color and that's because I like to use water to paint water and also I really feel that ecologically it's the best paint for me to use. You don't use a lot, you don't waste a lot and uh, it is dissolvable. Uh, so by using that surface it becomes, it, it does something very different than the surface next to it which is traditional paper. Um, so I'm, I'm working on different sizes. I have some five feet by five feet pieces and that's unusual for watercolor. And this is sort of part of that whole thing of p permission. I just like, let's try this. Um, and then I'm just doing small steps, bits and bits and bits. A year and a half after I got back, I was asked to write an article for the New York Times uh, for the travel section about uh, being on a cruise ship because my cruise ship was a different kind of cruise ship. And I was amazed to get a full page in the travel section. As a New Yorker, my father opened it, and it was, I had just won the Oscar. You know, <laughs> that was it, to be in the New York Times. But it has, it's a game changer. People still remember this article. They talk to me, I still get responses from it. It is still clicked on, on the New York Times website. It's just astonishing, and so I've, I have a copy of it there because I milk it for all it's worth. Um, but this is my son looking at me, thinking, you are not famous. Uh, but the day, literally the day that came out on paper, because it was out online on a Friday, the Sunday morning it was out, someone emailed me and bought one of the paintings that was in the article. And here's a funny thing about being an artist. The first thing they said is, will you give me a discount? <laughs> and because I didn't speak to them in person, I hadn't sold that much recent, at, at that point. And we have always been told, don't give discounts, don't give discounts. Because I was not speaking to them in person, I said, no. And I was like, oh, I just <laughs> blew it. Sent the email, I mean, right back, okay. And it's funny because all of a sudden I was in a different level. Like I just didn't realize that, but, but being in the New York Times, it was like you get to call the shots a bit more. So that was very exciting for me. Um, so now here's some photos. That's top left is a photo of Spy Pond in Arlington this year. Uh, in December, uh, actually it was last year, when, in December when it was so cold and the bubbles had frozen in the pond. The photo on the bottom right is um, a photo I took while walking the dog. That's in Stony Brook Reservation. Just an ice formation on the ground. It's amazing to see uh, what, what you see with the ice in every place that's different. So uh, that's near. This is far. That's Iceland on the top. Here you have these black stripes in the ice. Again, the ice is different in Iceland. And that's because of the volcanoes. So the ash lands on the ice, freezes, and then, you know, 10 years later, 20 years later, you know, it's covered in snow. And then um, as it comes off of the glacier, it flips, it goes on, you know, obviously the ice didn't come, the volcano didn't make the stripes that way, but the, uh, the iceberg is flipped on its side. And then this is just amazing to be living in this time where we can see ice on Mars. That's ice on Mars from a photo from NASA. I have sent the Jet Propulsion Laboratory some of my paintings and they are rock stars. They tweeted it all over the place, which was really cool. Uh, I'm a bit of a NASA geek, so it was fantastic. Uh, isn't that amazing that we can see that? So that is not my photo. I was, I've been asked that as well um, by kids if I was the first person, first woman on Antarctica and if I took the pictures of Mars. So neither of those did I do. But those are both public domain because of NASA, we own those. The next thing is the final slide and I just, this is me swimming in the Arctic. Um, this is the only place we could go where there were no polar bears 
because polar bears can swim. The dog did the um, tour of the beach, making sure there were no, but there was a town on one side and the dock on the other side. The point was we were gonna go in, take a dip, and then run back out, wash on the boat, you know, hot water. So I went in and I said, it's like Maine. It's not bad, Maine in April, right? I was in for about a second, then I was like, oh, it's so bad! <laughs> and I ran up, my roommate was right on the beach, she didn't want to go, and she wrapped me in a towel, I ran up to the thing, and to this day, I still have a little bit of frostbite in my fingers when it's really, really cold. I always have to wear gloves. But I encourage you to be brave, even if it's stupid. <laughs> That's it. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, thank you. Any questions about anything? Uh, have you found that your perception of color in your day-to-day -day life has changed since your trips to the Arctic and Antarctic? Uh, yes, definitely because I look at color more. I would say I brought, because I brought film to the Antarctic, I brought a roll of black and white. I was going to be all Ansel Adams. You know, fantastic. It was the worst role I took because there are so many colors there. And it really opened my eyes to seeing things. And so now I see a lot, especially in the winter here, because I don't particularly enjoy the summers here. I, winter is my season. And people often see the winter as kind of boring and white and dead. And there's just so much color in the snow and on the ground and in the leaves. and you know, the evergreens, obviously. Um, so I do see more. I would say it's not so much about the trip, although that opened my eyes to some extent. It's that I look at color more as I paint more. If you think about it that way, I'd say that may have had more of a, an effect on it. Um, it is, I mean, I do love color. And I'm glad that there's color in all the places I love. Anybody else? What happens if you touch the scary whale boat or moss? Yeah, traveling to these places, you have to be respectful. This is, this is not, there's nobody who's going to say, um, well, I mean, people who were the tour guides would have said something. They said, you can't go over there. Um, but you go on to a trip like this with the understanding that you respect that this is part of our planet that we want to preserve. If everybody took a piece of that moss, it, wouldn't, it would be gone. And the same is true with those whale bones. I was interviewed by a woman who said, did you take one home? And I was like, first of all, do you understand the size of a blue whale? <laughs> ah, but it's illegal. You cannot bring that. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the actual uh, the actual laws in terms of bringing mammals, uh, pieces of mammal stuff into the states, but there's definitely restrictions. And, and I think, you know, anytime you go to a place that's a nature preserve, that's what these are, you know, you, you have to act respectful. We did have one artist who painted some of the rocks and he was really yelled at by the tour guides. He was, and they were like, you have to clean that. And it's already disturbed them. So, you know, it isn't a silly question. It's more about, you know, we're not just there to put our stamp on it. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, thank you for the talk, Phil. Uh, so you mentioned the garbage. Uh, where is this garbage coming from? From the sea? From uh, this, the garbage that was collected was... Um, you know, there's all sorts of currents. So wherever the current comes from is where the garbage will flow from. Because we are so far north in Svalbard, we were near the Russian coast. Um, and I can pull up that map if you want to see that. But we we're, so there were fishing villages up there and mining camps up there and boats, cold water fishing. So there would be nets. There was, I mean, we found a sneaker, you know, and it's, Things take a long time to degrade there, even longer than when it's hot. Because in hot, you do have the bugs, you do have more animals that would decompose what you could decompose. I think the worst part of it is the nets, because 
those are the things that whales and um, other mammals that need to breathe in the water and fish in general they get caught and that that's sad and horrible um, but that's that it was coming from Russia from that kind of thing um, some days we didn't see any but if you think about even the coast here, we get currents from, you know, the north, and they come down, so we get garbage from there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no problem. Anybody else? So I'm always trying to find new places. So what are the places? You also said you like the cold a lot. So you must have a like, list of places on of ideas and all that, like some non-standard places, like northern Quebec is on my list and stuff like that. Do you have stuff like that on your list? Um, well, the place I'd really like to go right now is Greenland. Greenland is just beginning to get on tourists' radars. Um, part of it is because of the melting, and people want to see it. Um, but the glaciers in Greenland are amazing. I've flown over them in the daylight, and you can see the glacier movement. A glacier is a, is a frozen river, and so it's always moving. And even though it's small amounts, so you can see the motion from the plane. I can't wait to go to Greenland, but it's expensive. All of these island places, Iceland is expensive. Places where they don't grow a lot of their own food. Alaska can be expensive. Um, but Greenland would be my first place. Iceland, anybody who talks to me about Iceland, that's an amazing place. There's so much in Iceland. There's lava, there's hot springs, but there's glaciers and there's, you know, you can swim in the water, the hot, the hot waters as well. Uh, so, and it's so close, that's the other thing. Iceland is a very tourist friendly place. They all speak English. Um, after Greenland, I, I'd love to go back to Antarctica, but it's a really long trip, you know? That's the thing, and expensive also. I, I've talked to people about trying to be an artist in residence on a tour boat, you know, something like that, to kind of, you know, mitigate the cost. Uh, and again, I don't mind talking to people, so I'm fine with that. But uh, that would be that would be top, top of the line there. Yeah. Anyone else? I was just curious if you had any big traveling plans. I guess you just talked about it. But <laughs> if you had any big traveling plans for, um, if uh, it sounded like your kid was going to move out of the house. Yes. Once he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that's when I can, I've started applying for grants to go to, to places like Greenland and Iceland. Uh, there are a lot of artist residencies on Iceland, but they're mostly inland. Um, so, and I really want to be on the shore. Um, but uh, yeah, again, you know, I'll start applying. I could never go to, back to Antarctica. I went before he was born, and that is during the school year. So unless you're in Australia or something where the school year's different, uh, you, it would be impossible. Um, and like I said, it really took a hit on the family. I would say we, you know, just pulling him back from what was a really tough time. I mean, it's, to be honest, it sucks to be 12, right? You know, in a new school. And uh, then it's not helpful if your parents are kind of trying to figure out what's going on for a month during that time. So that's the, yes, once he's gone, see ya. <laughs> but, you know, people often ask me what people wore or ate on the ship. Does anybody want to know that? Yeah, that, that's like, like, I always get asked that. Um, the ship had to have two weeks worth of food. There was no place to stop. And so we had, they had these huge freezers and the fresh fruit was like, Really, really, they had been refrigerated pears, refrigerated apples, stuff like that. But we had a lot of fish and a lot of stuff that you could freeze. In terms of clothing, it was all the same um, that what you would wear in February here. But the one thing on this ship is that because it was all almost all women in this group, they did not buy enough toilet paper. So my roommate and I, we're both from the New York area, were not we were like we're taking it i don't care you know we we put on our best new york thug attitude so to speak and we would sneak in to the group 
bathroom and steal rolls before. And then we arrived at this one store, the, the mo- northernmost store, and um, they bought a ton of toilet paper. But it was like the things that they can't prepare for, you're in trouble when you're on that. So you were going to have a question? Yeah. Unrelated question, though, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you're on a tall shirt. Did yeah. You sail? We did. We did. Um, it is a barkentine. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you. Um, there were times when we were under full sail, but for much of the time, it was combined. Um, you know, but yes, we were we were often used to help pull the sails up, pull them down, wrap them up, whatever. There was a point when we were sailing, and it was really rough. And they said, you have to be below. And we were like, OK. And I don't particularly get seasick, so that was no problem. There were people in other rooms who were just tossed in their cookies. But me and my roommate were fine. And we were just like going like this, like this. And I was so proud. I was like, look at us in the Arctic Ocean. You know, because you know, I'm all like Shackleton. Um, and we get out, and I realized we were in like a fjord. It was nothing. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we don't know anything. You know, it was rough, but it was, I don't think we had any kind of experience of that, of that really rough weather. Although in the Antarctic, we were, a storm was chasing us. So as we went down, there was a storm behind us. You could only get off the boat if it was less than 35 knots, the wind. Um, so we, and we got off the boat every day, two or three times every day. The boat that was behind us never got off. They could never get off the boat. So you never know what's going to happen when you go to Antarctica. But when we came back, we went into the teeth of it. And we got hit by a rogue wave, which stove the side of the boat in. It wasn't a sailboat. And I, did, I was in the cheap seats. I was in the bottom of the boat, because I couldn't afford more than that. The people who had paid a lot of money where they could have like a balcony. or whatever. So it was like this. So this part doesn't move as much. So I didn't really know. I didn't even feel it. I was like, whatever. And then we went up, and I was like, oh my god. And the whole side of the boat is like punched in. And they had to change course, because we can't keep going into this. They said, oh yeah, we'll fix it in a day. It happens all the time. Um, and they, there was going to be another tour group leaving. Like, we get off on Saturday, they leave on Sunday. They said, oh yeah, we'll be ready for that. Yeah, it was, they're used to a very different uh, scale. Those things. And last question, at, at night, you know, we have so much light pollution here, what were the stars like? Was it amazing? They were amazing. It's cold at night. When the sun is done, it's really cold. And so you have a lot of tears, you know, so it, it is, and I wear glasses. So it's not as easy, but I would say probably one of the first times I've ever seen the Milky Way. I, you know, I don't see that in New York, here. I, I have no ex- experience with it. Um, and so they were amazing, but I couldn't see them all the time that well. We did see a tiny bit of northern lights, but they were to the south of us, you know, just a little bit. It's very hallucinogenic and in that kind of thing where you're just seeing this tiny bit of green, and you're like, is that real? And, you, you know, you're tearing that amount of time, too. So it's like, what's real? What, what am I imagining? Yeah. So uh, kind of cool, but also uh, a little bit weird. Anybody else? Thank you so much for listening to me.